Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. It's the parable of the talents. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have five more for you. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one with the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed, so I was afraid. I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have it. Take back what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, I did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with bankers, and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For all those who have more will be given, and all those who, and they will have abundance. But for all who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Thanks be to God.
Will you join me in a brief moment of prayer? Gracious God, be with all of us gathered here today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When Jane and Michael Banks entered the door of Fiduciary Fidelity Bank with their father, no one aside from their rather omniscient nanny could probably have foreseen the chaos that would ensue. You see, having grown incredibly frustrated with his children wasting their days on worthless frivolity to the exclusion of all else, Mr. Banks suggested to his children's nanny that if they must go on outings, these outings must be fraught with purpose, yes, and practicality. He was tired of hearing about his kids popping in and out of chalk pavement pictures, consorting with racehorse persons, fox hunting. Well, he didn't really have a problem with that one quite so much. It's traditional, you know. But tea parties on the ceiling? God forbid. Mary Poppins couldn't have agreed more. She was so committed to having her children, the children pressed and dressed for their outing to the bank with their father the next day. And while Mr. Banks wasn't quite sure that such an outing was his idea, he thought it to be exactly the kind of outing the kids should have. On their way to the bank, as they're walking through town and seeing all the sights of London, Jane and Michael are impressed to see that the old bird woman, Mary Poppins, so eloquently, eloquently sang about the night before, was right where she said she would be. Delighted, Michael asked his father if he could spend his money, his toppence, pennies really, on food for the birds. Now whether you've seen the movie or not, or read the book, I'm sure you can guess that Mr. Banks finds this idea ridiculous. Instead, he suggests, that Michael should do the safe and responsible thing and invest in the bank, something he thinks that Michael might find quite interesting. <laughs> so the children follow their father into the bank and meet the bank partners. Now at this point, because it's Disney, a wonderful song ensues. <laughs> and it goes something like this. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> if you invest your toppings, wisely in the bank, safe and sound, soon that toppence, safely invested in the bank, will compound. And you achieve a sense of conquest. They're good at Wardian Brits, aren't they? As your affluence expands in the hands of the directors who invest as propriety demands. Investing as propriety demands. In other words, to Mr. Banks and the partners, investing is best done by safely conforming to exception, accepted conventional standards and morals. It's the right thing to do. I believe the story of Mary Poppins and the Banks family is about investment. Not the kind of investment touted by the partners of Fidelity Fiduciary Bank, after all, while this is one of the more climactic scenes in the movie, it really is the only scene where money and this kind of investment are mentioned at all. And the parable of the talents seems pretty similar. It seems to be about money and investment as well. But it's only about money in the sense that money is mentioned. A talent, as referred to here, is an extremely large sum of money. Not just, oh, here's a bag full of money, large. We're talking 15 years wages for the average worker in one talent. So the fact that he gives five talents, two talents, one talent even, that is a huge amount of money. But that is the extent to which this parable is about money. So the parable must be about investment. What kind of investment? 
Usually when we hear the parable of talents in worship, it's connected to the talents, meaning gifts and skills, like we talked about with the kids this morning, that were given to us by God, and how we should use those talents so we don't squander what God has given us. And that is an absolutely accurate reading. Our gifts, skills, and resources, no matter how big or small they are, are all useful and necessary to the success of our community and to the success of this church. There is no denying that. And if we invest our talents into the life of the church, our church will be better for it. It's the reason we have stewardship campaigns, right? It's the reason we ask for Sunday school teachers all the time. It's the reason Matt's teaching Sunday school today. It makes sense. It's an important message for us to be reminded of. But I don't think that reading goes quite far enough. I think there's something more. For one thing, that reading doesn't tell me the so what. Okay, great. I have talent. I'll use them for God. So what? By the way, this is just a little tidbit I found out. Did you know that as a result of this story's popularity and circulation in the Middle Ages, the word talent came to the English language to mean the gifts and skills given to us by God? I just thought that was interesting. So this parable isn't about money. And it's about more than our God-given talents or gifts. Then what, it is, what is it about? As always, I think it helps to know a little bit more about the story. Within Matthew's gospel, there is another telling of this in Luke, by the way, but it has a little bit different twist. So in Matthew's telling of this parable, it comes in a series of three parables, which we have four, really, with next week, which we've heard over the past few weeks. Jesus tells these parables during his second Sermon on the Mount. Just prior to this, he predicted that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. Just after this, he's betrayed and we begin the Passion story. Contextually then, Jesus is preparing his disciples for the end of things as they know it. A fancy word for that is the eschaton. It's no surprise then that each of these parables in the lectionary cycle has been one way or another talking about accountability. Jesus is reiterating over and over again, because even though I'm sure they're great guys, the disciples are a little slow on the uptake most of the time. <laughs> He's re reiterating over and over again that all of this stuff I've shown you, he says, basically, all of this stuff I've taught you, you need to put it into practice. Because if you don't, things are not going to go so well for you. Now, this apocalyptic tone might seem a bit alarmist to us now, maybe even a little Y2K-ish. Y'all remember that? But for the community to which Matthew was writing, it would have felt a little bit more urgent. Scholars tend to agree that the Gospel of Matthew was written sometime around 80 or 90 of the Common Era. They've come to this conclusion for lots of reasons, but one of them is because there's references to the destruction of the temple, which happened about 10 to 20 years earlier in 70. This is really helpful to know because it explains a little bit about Matthew's focus on the end times. Jerusalem had been destroyed, just as Jesus said it would. And Jesus said that when the temple was destroyed, the Son of Man would return to usher in the kingdom of God. So in this context, Matthew's focus on accountability between the end times and the return of Jesus really makes sense. And even though they never saw Christ's return and we haven't seen Christ's return, we, we we're told it's going to happen. And so we, do, we don't know when, but it's going to happen. So we better behave in a way that does not get us thrown out into darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Knowing all this, it becomes clear that Matthew is telling us less about using our gifts because God gave them to us, which would have more to do with what God has already done for us, and instead is telling us about what God wants us to do or will do with us. Now, what of the story itself? There are four major characters, the master and three slaves. Upon leaving for a trip, the master distributes a ridiculous amount of wealth among three slaves. A talent, by the way, would easily equate to $250,000 today, if not exceed that. 
it is a ridiculous amount of money just to be handed over. To the first slave, he gives five talents. To the second, he gives two. And to the third, he gives one, each according to his ability. Each of these slaves has been entrusted with a lifetime, if not more, worth of wages. So even the last guy, who the master, because of his ability, apparently, was pretty sure he couldn't really handle all the responsibility, still gets one talent. Then he leaves. Doesn't tell him what to do with it. He gives him the talents, and he leaves. The first and second sl servants, or slaves, take the wealth they've acquired from their master, and they trade it, and they end up doubling their master's money. While the third slave takes the wealth from his master and buries it in the ground. After a long time, the master comes to settle accounts, and the slaves one and two are commended for their good work and are put in charge of even more. And that's really all we have to say about them. Sure, we assume that that's how God wants us to behave and how God would like us to act with the talents that we've been given. But if they were the focus of this lesson, I'm pretty sure Matthew would have spent more than four verses between the two of them talking about it. The role they tell in the story is really just to have something to which to compare the actions of the third slave. So the third slave, that's where the fun begins. When the master approaches the third slave, he says, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, in my post, maybe post, we're not quite sure, economic recession sensibilities, it doesn't really seem like all that bad of an idea, right? Not that poor of a decision. He thought he was being prudent by making the wise choice of saving his master's money so that he'd get back exactly what he left him. And apparently he had good reason based on the kind of man he thought or he thought he knew his master to be. But the master rebukes and chastises him and says, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. So... You ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return, I would have at least received what was mine with interest. He takes the talent from the slave, gives it to the first slave, and says, for all those who have, more will be given, and they will have abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And as for this worthless slave, throw him out into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What? That doesn't sound like Jesus to me at all. Was keeping the money buried in a hole so terrible of an idea that nothing was lost? Really, was that the worst thing he could have done? So terrible a crime as to be tossed out into nothingness? At the risk of sounding insensitive, yes. That was the worst thing he could have done. See, it's not the productivity of the first two slaves that make them great. And it's not the lack of profit that dooms the third slave. This parable is about investment. But it's about the motivation for that investment. It's about taking a risk, resisting fear, and emulating the example we've been given. The first two slaves know their master to be a shrewd businessman, and so they emulate in their handling of the master's wealth what the master would do. The third slave acts out of fear and distrust, regardless of the fact that the master had shown him extreme generosity. And he lets his view of the master keep him from fully living into the opportunity that he's been given. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, but Jesus is not a harsh man. Jesus is not a harsh man who reaps where he does not sow. And you'd be right. He's not. But the point isn't that Jesus is the master in this story. The point is that the slaves are emulating the master in this story. And our master, as it were, 
has set a pretty radical and risky example for us to follow. And he has called us as disciples to take a risk and invest. Our call as disciples is to emulate Jesus by faithfully living out our call to discipleship. But that's not something that we can do passively. And it's certainly not without risk. God took a huge risk in Jesus. Think about it. God loved us so much that he invested in our humanity. Jesus, Emmanuel, God incarnate, God with us. He ate like us, he walked like us, he did a lot of things like us. That's a huge risk on God's part. And it's an incredibly risky investment in a people who over and over and over again screw up and don't do what God hopes we would do. But it's all done for the sole purpose of allowing us to have a real and full understanding of God's love and grace. And God calls us to emulate that risk by investing ourselves as well. By being overly cautious, by hoarding God's investment in us, we don't gain anything. And in fact, I think this is where those last two lines of the parable are going. For all those who have, more will be given, and they will have abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. I think this suggests that what happens when we respond timidly to God's investment in us, God's investment in us was abundant. So our response to God must be equally abundant. If we respond abundantly and risk investing ourselves, we will see a return on that investment. If we don't, if we take God's investment and squirrel it away, where without really taking it we're out into the world, we're also taking it away from ourselves. It would be like buying ice cream and knowingly letting it sit out on the counter until it melts and molds and is unedible. Who would do that? It's ice cream. What would be the point? For many of us, a life of faith or discipleship is no more risky than believing the ideas we have in our head about God or Jesus. And church is no more risky than making sure we get here on time, or maybe even a little early, so no one takes our usual seat. (laughs) But if we really look at today's parable, it turns out that the real risk, the real risk in life is playing it safe and not taking any risk at all. The real risk is not investing in anything. The real risk is living cautiously and prudently and not doing anything with that abundance of love and grace that God has given us. Back in the lobby of Fidelity Fiduciary Bank, the partners have quieted from their song And the president of the bank, Mr. Dawes Sr., hungrily, with lip-smacking lust of a cartoon wolf, really, I mean, snatches the toppings out of Michael's hand. Pandemonium. There's a scuffle. There's yelling. There's crying. And with the help of his sister, Michael wrestles the toppings back from the elder Mr. Dawes and runs from the bank. This says nothing about Michael's love for his father. This says nothing about how he feels about that time he spent with his dad. He loves his father dearly, but turning his toppings over to the advancement of the empire, however safe that may have sounded at the time, isn't what he wanted to do. So instead, he takes a huge risk and invests in the bird woman. He invests in jumping into chalk pavement pictures. He invests in jumping merry-go-round horses off their merry-go-round and into a horse race. He invests 
in childhood. And he invests, though the sound of it is something quite atrocious, <laughs> in supercalifragilistic expialidocious. <laughs> That's the kind of risky investment God calls us to make. To live fully into our call to discipleship, we must be willing to risk investment. We must be willing to get involved. Jesus' warning that in this parable is that to not get involved, to not care passionately, to not invest ourselves or risk anything is something akin to being thrown out into the darkness. God didn't give each of us gifts and abilities, regardless of how big or small they might be, so that we'd keep them for ourselves. God has empowered us all with certain gifts and skills so that we can take an active part in helping make the kingdom of God a reality here and now. That's the kind of investment God made in us through Jesus Christ, and that is the kind of investment that God expects from us in return. Amen.